Приветствую всех, кто присоединился к нам сегодня. And I would like to first announce the rules of our discussion today. We'll have four rounds, and each speaker will have two minutes to talk. And I will start with this question. How to build inclusive economy in Kazakhstan and in the region? And I would request Maksad Kurbenov first tell us about the term inclusive economy. What is that? Because some people don't know about it yet. Hello, distinguished colleagues. Hello, Kasim Khan and Mark. I'm happy to welcome you and very happy to see you. Thank you for taking part in our Nobel Fest. For us, this is a great honor and a good opportunity to talk about the most important topic for Kazakhstan and for Central Asia region and for Caucasus, how to build up inclusive economy, inclusive society, inclusive policy. And as Aida asked me, I think we need to discuss first, what is inclusiveness? In my opinion, inclusiveness, inclusive society is uh, the society which uh, is able to receive all the uh, well-being that is created. And um, so the government creates something and the people, all of them, are able to receive it. And uh, when this well-being is trickled down to everyone in the society and not just stays with one group, so we are talking today about inclusiveness. When we established the Inclusive Development Foundation, we've been thinking a lot about why this term and why this topic is so important for our region. Because we see that what is happening now, is, it's very important for Central Asia region and Caucasus, because inclusiveness will be the topic for the next decade. How to make such a society that is able to receive all the benefits with the support of developing technologies and internet, we see that the society demands transparency, openness. Today, we are broadcasting to thousands of people, what I'm saying, this is all live broadcast and this is all recorded on YouTube and the society will never be the same. It, it will never go back to the past. It will always require openness. And this is a great development that were given to us by social media. And the government should understand that, that people will keep demanding, demanding changes for the better. And I would like to say that so that we could make inclusive economy, what can we say? We cannot build it. We cannot build inclusive economy without inclusive policies. Inclusiveness should be in everything, not just in economy, in policies and in the society. The society should be able to participate in political processes. Only with this condition, the economy will be inclusive. So that we could build inclusive economy, I would like to say that we need to start to build the real economy based on the fundamental principles of state development, such as the high development level of education, uh, healthcare, rule of law, and the fight with corruption. And this will enable the well-being 
and uh, some smaller measures won't have results. We need to have holistic approach. And I would lo like to say the words of the well-known Russian economist who said, he was answering the question, how successful states are different from unsuccessful states? And I think this is all very relevant for inclusiveness. There are only three differences. First, elites should uh, make the laws for themselves and disseminate for others. If there are laws, it means that everybody should follow the laws. Second, second difference, organizations should not be developed for personalities. They should live longer than personalities. Personalities are needed, but organizations should keep developing after one management left. And uh, third is that the general security system should be in the collective hands. Um, the parliament should have it, but it should not depend on one person or a narrow group of people. So these are the three basic uh, differences that distinguish successful countries from unsuccessful countries. And this is it from my side. Thank you very much. And now I would like to give floor to Mr. Mark Ozan, who is now in Paris. What is your vision in building inclusive economy in our region? Could you share your experience? Maybe you can add something. Thank you. Well, uh, thank you first. Uh, thank you very much for the organizer to inviting me here on a Sunday morning to participate to this uh, very interesting forum where we can hear a lot of different voices from different countries and provide also the possibility for many stakeholders to participate and to understand what is at stake, not only for Central Asia, for Kazakhstan, but also for the global economy. Maxal Corbina just mentioned to the inclusive economy, and when you start about talking about inclusive economy, you need to define what inclusive growth, what inclusive economy is all about. And I will say one thing, inclusive growth, inclusive economy, is about creating opportunities for all. That's I will start with that first definition. Of course, Central Asia and Kazakhstan today are facing major, major challenges. You remember, we have the first global financial crisis. That was the first external shock that hit the region. Now you have, in uh, 2014, the commodities cycle ending. And now you have not only a global health crisis, you have a major economic crisis. And we don't know yet what's going to be the outcome of this crisis, because this is something global. This is something that has been decided by decree because we have to stop economic activity. And on top of that, you don't know anymore is a paradigm for the global economy will still be with us. You remember for the last two decades, what we were discussing around the world was globalization. It was all about bringing capital flow. It was all about bringing foreign direct investment. We don't know yet with this global health crisis is we are going to live under that paradigm. So are we going to shift from um, a modified globalization to something different that are going to bring inclusive growth, inclusive economy for all? And how we are going to achieve that under a major, not only slowdown for countries in terms of growth, but also, as you don't know anymore, when this crisis will end, we are need to embrace major uncertainty. We don't know yet we are going to go back to a lockdown we are going to deal with stop and go for the next few months, not only in Kazakhstan, I believe, but also in Europe, in the US. So thinking about inclusive growth, I will define it also to try to think about the new concept of three R. The three R's are resilience. It's about reshoring and it's about the repurposing of states. You know, you need to deal with vulnerabilities of people who don't have access to global financial safety net, you need to deal with different shock, commodity shock at this moment. You need to deal with trade shock and you need to deal with tourism shock. You know that your growth will not be there. And how you are going to be able to redistribute that growth for the most vulnerable is going to be a strong, strong challenge. 
And I know, of course, a big difference between advanced countries and emerging markets like Kazakhstan. In Europe, for example, in the US, you saw the policy response from government. We have the fiscal space because we have the capacity, in fact, to borrow at a very low interest rate. And you have the concept of whatever it takes that came from the central bank and from the fiscal authorities that brought you know, a lot of support for small and medium companies, for the people, and also to make sure that people at this moment who are losing their job can still receive income. How can you do it in, the, in Central Asia? It's a big challenge because the fiscal space is very narrow. At the same time, you know, the banking sector is very weak in the, in the region. How you can bring this into play at a moment where you have to deal also with health crisis, where remittances are becoming lower and lower, where young workers cannot go to work? because it can trigger clusters. So this is a very challenging times for Central Asia, a very challenging time that needs to try to bring and to shift the policy response to bring opportunities for all. What can we do in order to achieve that? I will argue that fiscal policy needs to clearly facilitate and prioritize investment in people and in infrastructure. Number two, which I think is going to be critical moving forward and that's going to be an important policy response for all emerging markets. You need to increase financial inclusion. You need to have access and use financial service to make growth more inclusive and to allow households and firms to invest in opportunities. People talk about, well, we need to make a green economy, we need to become more digital, but you need infrastructure, you need a network to work. So I believe the repurposing of the state is going to invest in all building the right infrastructure for the people and in order to facilitate and to accelerate the digital economy. Yes, government, government actions are going to be critical. I will agree with Maxat, you know, about bringing opportunities for all, but you need to repurpose the state and the state is going to work for the people at a time of so many uncertainties for the Kazakh economy, but also for Central Asia. Last point, the capacity of Kazakhstan also, you have the possibility through your sovereign wall fund to use that fiscal space to invest in people. Remember how difficult it was, you know, to bring safety net to people. So financial inclusion, you know, thanks to technology, you will be able to send money to people differently. So yes, a very important um, uh, set of challenges for not only for the global economy, but for Central Asia. And I would argue that in the next two, three years, everything will be directed to the way to improve governance, to improve infrastructure, and to leverage fiscal policy to make opportunities for all the reality. Спасибо большое, господин Узан. Thank you very much, Mr. Uzan. Давайте передам слово вам, господин Саркеев. I would like to give floor to Mr. Sarkeev. How do you see building inclusive economy in Kazakhstan from the science point of view? So I would like to talk about inclusiveness, not just about Kazakhstan, but generally about the region, because today's conference is broadcasted for the regional countries. For our countries, what issue is relevant? Because we are all in more or less similar conditions, and uh, some countries have already positive developments, some countries have achieved success, and uh, others still have a lot to do. But in building inclusive economies, I think we need to follow the uh, Global Competitiveness Index, which is the index that was uh, initiated by the World Economic Forum. And we need to follow all those factors. Can you maybe name some? Well, of course, we need to improve the institutional factors and uh, the rule of law and um, the independence of judicial system, administrative procedures, corruption. We need to improve the macroeconomics and we need to improve human capital, education and healthcare and innovational capacities.
and in general create a favorable environment for entrepreneurship development. So the Global Competitiveness Index shows the positions of the countries compared to 140 countries compared all over the world. And if we look at this rating, I think this is quite objective because at the top of it are the developed countries where really do have the rule of law principles working. And for our countries, I think the institutional reforms are the most relevant because our economies develop, depend on institutional reforms, which would enable establish good environment. We should uh, ensure protection of uh, ownership rights. So any person, when he or she creates a business, they should be sure that nobody will take the business away from them. Rule of law. Every person should be sure that all the laws that are adopted in this country, that they are really enforced. Independence of the judicial system. Whenever a person is uh, confident that if he has to apply the judicial bodies, he should be sure that they will be unbiased and fair. And uh, another relevant issue is uh, the transparency of uh, budget system. People should know how the costs and uh, expenditures are formulated in the budget, how the money is spent, and this should be controlled by the civil society. So I think we should have reforms done in Kazakhstan. And I think within the last 20 years, Kazakhstan has been involved in many reforms. And there is a lot to be done still. But if we see all the countries who are successful in our region, we can use the experience of Georgia. I think Georgia is the best in inclusiveness compared to other countries in the region. I think it's, it is the most successful. Can you add something on that? Uh, what's your, where do you stand? Uh, good afternoon, colleagues. First of all, you're absolutely right. The term of inclu inclusion, it's not well, well spread. And not, well, it's not been uh, described very uh, often. There's possibilities for every citizen, no matter where you were born. It could be a city, a village, uh, no, what, no matter what race you are, what gender you are. You could be young, you could be elder. You could be older. What's your, no, matter, no matter what's your first language is, your mother tongue is, all economic capabilities and opportunities for you as a citizen of Kyrgyzstan shall be absolutely equal. Of course, inclusion is not... It's, it's a continuous process. It's a continuous struggle with the economic inequality. None of the social group should be discriminated uh, by one or another uh, category. Unfortunately, today we have a prevailing factor in understanding of the inclusion economy, the understanding of uh, equality in results. So the government basically looks at the, to the level of where a citizen, a citizen is. And basically Based on that, uh, it builds its policy. If we talk about uh, low-income citizens, just to ensure uh, inclusion, uh, the, uh, the, the state has to replenish uh, the outstanding part. Although this paradigm is basically aimed to uh, be post-active rather than proactive. So that is why the inclusion, is, uh, the capability should address uh, to make sure that every citizen has equal rights, I mean, economical rights, uh, and uh, the citizen would be able to uh, leverage all his rights. I would like to exemplify uh, a Japan, Japan, Japanese experience. Uh, the infrastructure is really well developed, as you may know. And I was uh, with us there in this very center of Tokyo, and uh, even in the outskirts of uh, any village, 
knowledge, the infrastructure was more or less the same. I mean, the quality of water, the availability of electricity, then availability of utilities, healthcare facilities, and so forth. So in order to build that infrastructure and the importance which was highlighted by Mr. Yuzan before, in order to construct that infrastructure, Japan uh, spent a lot of money. They sourced, um, they just sourced uh, some, and their debt is 200 of their GDP. But in fact, it's not that uh, scary because all this money works in their national economy. Uh, these money works for the people to make sure their life it will be, be better. Now, talking about Kyrgyzstan and how to build an inclusion inclusive economy in Kazakhstan. I think it's highly important that we have uh, such an instrument, such a, like a well, national a sovereign welfare fund. And the primary target, I think, of this very fund shall be an establishment of an inclusive society to make sure every citizen receive, receives equal opportunities. Why will we need to pay so uh, at much attention to the uh, infrastructure development? Uh, now, in the year of uh, pan pa pandemic, uh, we've really witnessed ourselves how it is important to have uh, the healthcare system and telecom systems and the development of these spheres. Now, in order to ensure uh, availability to all citizens, even in remote areas, uh, in villages, in uh, owls, in our regional centers, n now we have to use accumulated capital. Um, I'm talking about oil capital deliberately in order to invest it into the infrastructure. Because like we say, uh, people, it's a new oil. Uh, so now we have to convert oil uh, capital into human capital. So we would receive uh, returns from human capital, from people. Thank you so much, Kasim Khan. We appreciate your remarks. So today you basically uh, streamlined us to the second topic. I would, I would like to highlight key problems problems that were identified by the crisis, by the pandemic, which is surely correlated to that uh, 2020 uh, will stay in our memory as a coronavirus here. May I ask you, Mr. Uzan, uh, for your opinion, your view, what sort of problems we have in the economy deliberately, if we talk about our region, Central Asia, that are closely related to the pandemic? Please, the floor is yours. Well, thank you. Yes, indeed. Uh, not, I think I will argue that not only Central Asia, but all the whole world is facing more or less the same type of problem. Of course, I have laid out that the differences between what I will call the G7 countries, who have the capacity in terms of monetary policy to do, to do quantitative easing, meaning, you know, to do whatever it takes, you know, to be able to bring credit to the household and to, to, to the private sector in general. In the case of uh, Central Asia, what happened is that I think the trends that were already there before COVID-19 are already magnified, you know, and accelerated. So you are dealing now with three major shock, trade shock, you know, you, the rest of the world is either in depressions or in recession. So where do you export to? Okay. Commodities, oil, price have been going down. So the source of revenue of the state is clearly going down and you will see fiscal deficit going up. You didn't have, have before, and you still have a very low export diversification. So this thing has been magnified during COVID-19 crisis. The trade with China has contracted. Uh, and of course, so all these things, they were there before, and that the government was trying to think about long-term policy response has accelerated. And... Um, of course, remittances have been going down uh, in Central Asia. Um, so the health crisis, I think, has reflected the vulnerabilities in the region. Like in Europe, you know, we have so many vulnerabilities and suddenly we realize, in the case of my country, France, that we, you know, we didn't have the capacity to produce masks in March. So we saw you know, that we rely and we were very dependent of the rest of the world for our major and strategic import, like masks or vaccination or Medicaid. So it seems to me that at this moment, you need, we need this, you see this crisis has not been triggered by the financial sector. 
So the financial sector can be also part of the solution. This crisis is a health crisis. And we realized that at a global level that we didn't have the tools to do crisis prevention as we have done in, 2000, in 2007 to deal clearly with the financial crisis. We knew exactly what was the problem. We need to deal with the banking crisis and we resolve it. With the health crisis, this is still very uncertain. We need to deal with uncertainties. We don't know when a treatment will occur. At the same time, we might, and you, I don't know about the, st the state of Kazakhstan at this moment, you know, but we might be going to a stop and go where maybe one part of the country will go to a partial lockdown, like we are witnessing in Europe with the second wave. In the case of France, we see more and more cases. Part of the country will be closed or restaurants will be closed, cafe will be closed. So how you need to bring, you know, for the, for the household and the private sector, you know, to reduce that uncertainties, whatever it takes, I think should be, I think the government response. But of course, that's what I said, you know, the fiscal space is very critical. And of course you need, I totally agree, you know, inclusive growth should be the objective, it's all opportunities for all, but you don't build inclusive growth overnight. You need to rebuild governance, you need to provide, you know, um, the capacity of a financial safety net, social safety net. You need to redefine what the social contract is all about. So, yes, you need resources. And you realize that what you have been discussing in Central Asia for many, almost 12 years, 15 years, diversification. Yeah, how you diversify the economy shifting from oil commodities to a different type of growth model. Now you have no choice. You know, Kazakhstan, Central Asia, who have been dependent on commodities, we need to go full green. This is a moment to build the green economy. This is a moment to accelerate digitalization. This is a moment that despite all the uncertainties and the shock that you have been hit in Central Asia, you have no choice. You need to accelerate the green economy. But you have also, don't look at it at, um, at an earthquake. We need to look at the pandemic as a new age of imagination, as a capacity to redefine the role of the state, as a capacity for stakeholders to all work together. I didn't hear about this was... interesting foundation, inclusive, inclusive Development Foundation. This is exactly what you need. You need to build inclusive growth, and you need to look at the pandemic as an opportunity to build a strong economy for all based on the new drivers of growth who are going to be less dependent of commodities, but depending of shifting to a low carbon economy. Thank you so much, Mr. Ozan. Yes, yeah, speakers, uh, let's uh, follow the uh, timelines. I think we're really lack of time and we have to cover still a lot. Maxa, uh, would you please elaborate? Uh, will you please share your view just briefly? Two or one or two problems that were revealed by the pandemic in Kinexan and how uh, will the uh, inclusive. Uh, well, thank you so much, Aida. Uh, I really want to compliment Mark and, and uh, support. It, it's really revealed not only old problems, but it also has brought some new ones. It was like a uh, testing uh, page. Uh, it showed the world where we lived and how uh, did we cover it in the better times when we were talking we were talking about global competitive uh, rating and i would like to just mention one example on where we are now look uh 2013 uh based on that rating we were ranked 51 but in 2019 before pandemic we were ranked 55 what happened from 12 to 19 not only we uh, we, we we just degraded uh, that's the point. Even GDP per capita uh, in 2019, it was 12 thousand dollars. And then in 1219, it was about only nine thousand dollars. So it's also dropped. So it looks like during this period, the economics um, on these micro indices was just uh, on hold or even uh, going backwards. 
Um, so here, uh, so things that were mentioned by Mr. Uzan, uh, namely diversification of the economics, it's, uh, it was really mediocre, uh, not enough. Now, I would like to highlight the thing that we are always mentioning to, uh, that we have to diversify our economics, our economy, and it's been mentioned numerous times, but what are solutions we have on, uh, on the table? We have to, we, will we see times when the oil price will be always below 45 just to develop our spheres. Any ideas you would like to share with us in terms of uh, perspective spheres? I would like to put it this in this way. I'm against uh, when we have a sort of dictate from uh, these or that sphere where when the state dictates that this sphere will be of the highest importance. No, we have to see uh, what the demand, where the, the demand is, and if we're going to be competitive in these or that sector or sphere. So uh, the, if we, for example, it would be cheaper, cheaper for us to buy it and procure it from China, so the state does know where the, where the demand is, but it, it's well-known fact for the market. And when I tell you that if we if we will not if we don't stop and accept our problems, then we will even move backwards uh, even further. And today, in the era of industry industrialization 4.0, the availability of resources, which is which is we are famous for, it's is just the second matter. It's uh, absolutely non-essential. Our countries that uh, has the countries that have very large and huge uh, human capital, only these countries will be uh, at the top of uh, the edge. So now when we talk uh, the, about our natural resources, uh, why lithium ionic uh, batteries and um, why don't we start producing those batteries and cells? Why Tesla plants are opened in Germany? Uh, rather than in Kazakhstan, the answer is simple. The market is not there. The human capital is not there. It's not enough. It's underdeveloped, and we don't have a competition in place, and we cannot able to innovate those innovations and all the auxiliary uh, industrial infrastructure. Like it's been mentioned by Kasim Khan, the uh, special focus shall be paid to the human capital. It's a fundamental issue, and it's not possible to address it within one or two years. It's a long-term effort. We have to create conditions so people would create those innovations, those projects. Okay, now let's get to discussing the human capital and the brain drain. Yeah, brain drain, human capital drain from Kazakhstan. And uh, education, the problems that is facing and Kasim Khan also mentioned that. Kasim Khan, maybe you will join in into this discussion now. Yes, thank you very much. The human capital issue is quite urgent in Kazakhstan. Because on the one hand, during the last 20 years, we were able to have quite a good human capital to collect it com compared at least to the serious countries. But at the same time, we are facing new challenges of uh, retaining this human capital because the economic environment is uh, deteriorating during the last five years. And I think for a gifted, well-educated young person, what is important? The comforts of life, security, clean environment, good air quality, good water quality, high level of education, but at the same time, the wealth of opportunities for self-development. Um, and there's sure a lot we can do. We remember how Denis Tan was killed in Almaty in the middle of the day, and that, that was a great response in the society. And the personal security is a big issue in this big city. And also, the, you know, like what a quality of the air, how bad it is in Almaty and in other big cities of uh, Kazakhstan. And that's why young families make decisions to leave often. So you see, there are many problems and uh, they prevent us from retaining the human capital. These are the pushing factors. And there is other issue, which is related to pool factors. 
the big countries such as Russia, China, and the US, they're all very aggressive in uh, attracting talent. We know Russian universities actually have admission commissions coming to Kazakhstan, and they even provide grants for future students. China is doing the same. They provide up to five uh, 50,000 grants per year for Central Asian countries. The U.S. is promoting its educational programs as well, so that they could have the basis for the future um, future wealth for, for the next 50 years. Unfortunately, in Kazakhstan, this is not well resolved. We don't see the strategy how to retain talent, how to develop, and how to attract new talent so that people from other cultures and other countries could come to Kazakhstan and live here comfortably. A good example of such successful case is the Silicon Valley in the U.S., where people from all, all over the world are happy to come, and their ideas and knowledge is more valuable than their ethnical origin. Yes, thank you. And uh, could you please give us your opinion? Which issues you see and what solutions you see? The pandemic has revealed certain problem problems. And uh, most evidently such a problem that we didn't pay attention to the development of the human capital. We were not focusing on the healthcare system and the educational system, science system. And during the pandemic, all these issues became even more evident. Uh, our doctors are very low paid and uh, the medicine delivery system is not working well and schools do not have the relevant equipment, they do not have internet access. This is all revealed during the pandemic. And uh, we are still going through the pandemic, we see these problems now. So we should do the reforms in the management systems, the government management. And we should change our mindset and the attitude. The healthcare reforms and education reforms, this is not just about building new schools and hospitals. This is mostly important, creating enabling environment for doctors, scientists, and teachers. We've been doing many reforms during these 20 years, but we actually still didn't create the good conditions for teachers, the same in healthcare. We still don't have good conditions for doctors. So I think in the forthcoming reforms in education in science and in healthcare, we should be focusing on the people who work there. Let's focus on the creating enabling environment. So let's raise wages, let's provide accommodation and the professional development opportunities for teachers and doctors and scientists. It is not good when scientists are involved not in the research all day long, but actually looking for additional income because they look for certain contests in the research so that they could get additional grants. I think this is absolutely bad situation. So in the human development, human capital development, there should be government support. Well, the government should not be so controlling in business, but in human capital areas, there should be public financing available. Public financing for healthcare, science and education. Yes, we understand that. The government is protecting itself and building the foundation for the future. Maksat? Do you have anything to add about the brain drain and um, human capital drain from Kazakhstan? I would like just to provide you with figures. We're top uh, 10 donors on with regards to human 
but if we talk about brain drain uh, globally i think uh, we are a relatively small country but uh, like it was mentioned by Kasim Han, this problem is so topical for the developing markets and Kazakhstan is not uh, unique because the the uh, uh, struggle for human capital is now being brought to a very uh, unique and a very specific level just to make sure human capital is within the country uh, just to make sure people would like to work here and live here of course you have to create conditions you have to do something with regards to the conditions to well, I have an idea. Probably it's a good thing uh, when we uh, when we act as donors of human capital across the globe. Is there an opportunity for those people to, for example, establish all the conditions just to make sure they're back with the experience they gained abroad? What's your point? Uh, who would like to elaborate on that? Has anyone got any ideas? Or oh, I'm, I'm I'm just daydreaming and you're totally against me? No. Uh, well. Just in order to make sure they're back, we have to create conditions. Like I said, we have to reform uh, our governance system, state governance system, at the level of uh, inter well, corporate organizations and state organizations as well. One of the reasons why people leave, because uh, they are, feel they're not needed here. They're, they're not of demand. And Kazakhstani management, both, and we talk about corporate management and uh, public management and state management. The key mistake here they just don't just don't, don't value people human capital if one manager does not value people because the brain drain will go on and on so the management should be improved the management in the corporations and the state uh, organizations shall be approved as well because human capital is of the vital importance it's a top importance for them i totally agree i personally believe let's focus on on human capital which is here which we have now within the country and then we would have people coming back and back mr uzan is there anything you want to add and share with the, with us is there any chance to stop that uh, brain drain and how could we possibly do that well um i'm not very very familiar to you know what i believe is a brain drain happening in kazakhstan but also in many countries and of course this is also related this emigration is not very is is uh, it's a global phenomenon okay but what i think is missing is the discussions here is that we have been eating by a major shock with the global health crisis Remember, you have a lot of maybe of your citizens abroad in the U.S. or in Europe, and they were not able to come back to your country because of, um, of a border closure, no plane, no flights to go back. I think you see a major shift of behavior of people in the next decade. You know, I believe that what we used to take for granted, for example, being trained in the U.S. or being to go to U.K. universities, are going to change dramatically. I think, I believe that this crisis is not going to be, we are going back to normal. We are going to back where we were before. You know, global opening, capital flow going everywhere, people going everywhere, tourism. This is going to be very, very different. People will start to realize and to rethink their way of life. I mean, we were talking about the value added of your country. We didn't mention, you know, the potential with agriculture the potential of fresh air. You know, people start to realize that climate change is not just an abstract thing, it's reality. And we don't act now, it's going to be too late. So I think you have an opportunity to bring back the people who may be emigrated for different reasons, who can come and build something for your country. I think, you know, the world that we are going to see in the next decade is going to be less global, is going to be more local, and we are going to, I think, you know, people realize that maybe what I need to do is something for my, to build my own country, to help my country to do something. I can see already people, for example, in my country, in France, you know, been working in China or all, all over the world with this crisis, realize that it was so difficult for them, you know, to, um, to come back to France. And now there is a big trend happening that people are less willing you know, to travel and to walk abroad for a couple of years. So brain drain will maybe stop. But in order to do that, you need to bring 
you know, opportunities for people in terms of job opportunities, in terms of salary. And of, I think, you know, as a young country, young population, you have the capacity to build something, you know, that will be good for all citizens. So I will be maybe a little more optimistic. Let's look at this crisis as an opportunity for the region, like as an opportunity for the world. It's time not to be confined in our mind. It's to be, you know, we are being confined for three months here in the lower over the world. That's helped us to maybe rethink the way of life, to think about we don't need to consume as we used to. We don't need to think that, you know, our future lies to travel or to walk abroad. People are starting to realize that they need anchors. They need local. And maybe they will need to, you know, as you said, you know, you have a beautiful landscape to rediscover your own country. You know, you are part of what I will call nomad country. So, yes, these routes are going to be, I believe, re anchored I can tell you an example. In France, for example, I mean, most of the people wanted to live in big cities. Is the future will be to live in big cities? Maybe not. Is not, look at New York City. People are moving or shifting away from New York and they realize, you know, with, um, you know, walking from home, uh, not anymore office, is going to be a major shift in paradigm. So yes, brain drain is a current state for Central Asia, but maybe you have, and this is about inclusive growth, you can bring back these high-level experts that have been trained abroad to come back to your country and to build a country and help and enable, you know, this human uh, and the capacity building needed. So let's look at the world today that what is happening is as important, you know, like um, a collapse of uh, you witnesses with the Soviet Union when you need to, as an independent country, to start from scratch. I think what we are witnessing is maybe something along the same shot. Yes, we can build something. We know our weaknesses, but we have strength. You have a big country, uh, beautiful nature, and you can really, and young population. So the, the future belongs to the young population. Thank you. Mr. Zan, I'm really sorry to interrupt you. No problem. I think we're really short of time and almost just two minutes left. We have some questions from the audience. Uh, what shall we start from in order to construct uh, the Silicon Valley here in Kyrgyzstan? Kasim Khan, why don't we start with you first? Thank you so much. Because, well, talking about the Silicon Valley, it's been started from state uh, orders and universities. It's, of course, understandable that in Cadex, in, well, in, in the Kedestan case, well, strong universities is a basis uh, for science, basically. And the Silicon Valley has been well, it started from applied uh, researches that's been ordered by the Minister of Defense and has been implemented by universities and uh, some Calif universities in California. So, for Kedison, it's highly important to improve the quality of R&D, uh, which are run uh, in universities. And after that, I think the next stage would be uh, availability of funding just to make sure that those e ideas would be commercialized. Of course, there are some uh, issues related to uh, legal, to reg regulatory. I think, but today I think all startups there, um, they just work on a international standards. They work in the international jurisdictions and just to establish a Silicon Valley in Kyrgyzstan, not of the same level like in the US, but at least to try to repeat the success of either Israel or um, or South Korea. I think we need to have uh, strong universities first. Mr. Sarkeev, why don't you add something? For, for me, we have to uh, resolve and address the issue of funding. Like I said before, for the scientific uh, society, uh, the funding is the key priority. The key in the funding from the state, especially when I talk about applied research, applied sciences. The scientists should receive salary just for being a scientist, just for doing the research. Of course, there should be some uh, schemes in place, attracting business. That's absolutely necessary. Uh, we're working on those schemes. We're working on those ways because uh, we believe about that the granting 
uh, should be uh, put through, should be developed together with business. How much time do we have more? Maxa, uh, sort of a re wrap up from you as an organizer. Thank you so much, Aida, for such a fruitful discussion. I do thank all the participants and speakers. Thank you, Mark and Kasimhan. Mm, just a quick wrap up or summary, if you please, on what we've just mentioned. First of all, inclu inclusion, it's a equal opportunities and equal access for everyone, for every citizen. It's really essential to build a sustainable economy just to make sure it is sustainable to all the crisis. And in order to achieve that, we need to have a diversified economy. Like it's been mentioned rightfully by Mark, you know that, well, oh, you have to fund and make uh, credits available with very low interest interest rates and we have to ensure social protection of our population. You need to have also uh, fiscal stimulus in place for your business. Uh, the stress on the, well, the focus on uh, human capital. We need to have institutional reforms uh, to be carried out. We have to create favorable conditions to ensure protection of intellectual property. Uh, well, first of all, at the uh, regulatory basis just to make sure a person a person feels that it's his property or her property we need to have a very independent courts or well the experience of georgia is very interesting in so in terms of uh, inclusion uh, like has been rightfully mentioned by custom han uh, the targets of uh, sovereign wealth fund uh, it's the primary target shall be to develop uh, human capital and transform oil uh, capital into human capital mark mentioned we need to have a, a transfer towards a uh, green economy with a low level of uh, diversification revealed trouble or uh, revealed problems um, nationwide. We need to reform a uh, healthcare system and education system. We need to reform to improve conditions for uh, doctors, for scientists, and for teachers, of course. And it's really, we need to have a synergy uh, to construct uh, such regional uh, Silicon Valley's like uh, well, it's, it should be the synergy of business, of science. We need to establish institutes, relevant institute and universities. Well, thank you so much. I appreciate all the speakers. I do believe that you've learned so many things. Please stay with us. It will be really interesting. Thank you so much.